it's two o'clock, so hello everyone. And a very warm welcome to this webinar from GEM Motoring Assist, which is being presented to support the 2022 Project Edward Week of Action. Now, if anybody doesn't quite know what Edward stands for, in this context, it means every day without a road death. My name is Valerie Singleton, and I'm really delighted to be your sort of compare, I suppose, for this afternoon, and to actually sort of do this investigation online about the problems facing, and perhaps no problems as well, senior drivers. Now, if everybody's been driving as long as me, which is quite a long time, we do tend to think we're quite good drivers, don't we? I think I'm a good driver, but we all do get into sort of habits. And unless somebody points those habits out, we suddenly realize I'm not really supposed to be doing that. You know, we can get into trouble. So that really is going to be a lot of what this afternoon is about, about being a safe older driver. Now, let me look at some of the things that we're going to be planning for the next uh, hour or so. First of all, we're going to get a presentation from Professor Charles Musselwhite. Now, he is a psychologist with the University of Aberystwyth, and he's an absolutely world-renowned researcher in the problems and the issues relating to senior mobility. We're going to follow that up with uh, tuning in to Rob Hurd and Margaret Philly. Now, if you were watching our webinar a year ago, you'll remember that Margaret had just had a rather worrying diagnosis of macular degeneration, which meant it could affect her driving ability. Well, we're going to find 12 months on how that she's getting on. She's going to be in conversation with Rob Hurd, who is running the Older Drivers Forum. We're then going to come to June Howlett. Now, June is with the Buckinghamshire Council, and she's very well versed, and very well knowledgeable about the problems that actually worry and concern older drivers. Uh, she'll cover some very important topics, including uh, the viability of actually not having a car. Quite difficult to think about that one, isn't it? And also the role of family members in helping to keep an older person safe, and also the value of taking a driver assessment, which actually I did a few years ago, was really, really valuable. Now, after June, we're going to hear from David Motten. Now, David is the road test editor for GEM's quarterly membership magazine called Good Motoring. It's a terrific magazine. I get that every three months, and it's very, very good. It's got some fantastic articles in it. And David is going to take us some of the, through some of the latest safety technology, whether you think it might be worth you purchasing it, whether it'd be good for you, perhaps looking at any adjustments you like, might like to make to your own car, or whether you're sort of thinking of purchasing a new car and what might be sort of worth putting into that. Now, when David has finished, he's going to be the last speaker day, we're going to open up the webinar to questions and answers. So there's going to be a little question and answer side down at the side. So if you've got any questions as you're listening to people talking, please write those in and we'll try and get through to as many of those as possible. And the two people we'll sort of be getting advice from at that stage will be Charles Muzzlewhite and June Howlett. Now, the, the webinar, if you want to watch it again, is going to be available next week with the Project Edward website. So you need to go to that and then you need to go to the webinar section. Right, let's move on now. And our topic for this afternoon is, what is safer driving and why do I care? Now, our first speaker this afternoon, as I said, is going to be Charles Muzzlewhite. He's a psychologist, he's with the University of Aberystwyth, and he's very, very involved with applying social environmental and health psychology in understanding and improving the rate relationship between health, the built environment, transportation and health and well-being. Now in particular he's got great expertise in the area of gerontology, examining the relationship between environment and health in later stages of life, including older drivers Use, use of the road, how safe they're going to be, and also creating neighbourhoods, friendly neighbourhoods, and neighbourhoods that are good for communities. So, Charles, over to you. Thank you so much, Barry, for that introduction. It's great to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a little presentation to go through now. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a real honour to be here, to be able to talk um, well, show off a bit about the research that I've done. I love to be able to talk about it and particularly be able to talk about it perhaps to a non-academic audience and hopefully be able to make a difference to people's lives. What I wanted to do today was just go through some research that I've done about older drivers um, where I had the privilege of working with some older people who were going through the process of giving up driving and just how difficult that process was and it really got me thinking about the importance of 
what I call the sort of social and environmental context around which we drive. We talk very much about driving in very practical terms, but there's a lot more to it than that, that you can't really think about giving up driving if you don't think about the wider social and environmental issues associated with it. So I'm going to go through some of those today as an introductory um, uh, sort of lecture, if you like, for, for today. Now, there's going to be lots of slides with lots of information on. You don't have to take all of that in for now. Like uh, Valerie said, it will be available on the website afterwards. Anyone want to follow up anything, do get in contact with me afterwards and uh, I'll be more than happy to share more details with you so if I can move through the slides so we'll start off with something really really positive and that's that um, actually older drivers on the whole as a cohort are pretty safe drivers we do see an increase in collisions particularly uh, represented by those who get injured or killed uh, on the road from about 75 years onwards and particularly from 85 years onwards but We've had a number of researchers look at this over uh, a number of years, and, and we're pretty certain that almost all of that increase is simply due to um, frailty that happens in later, like as a normal part of the aging process. So you're more likely to be injured, more likely to be killed from something you might have walked away from um, earlier on in life. There are a few caveats to that. Um, and I'll go through those uh, in, in a little bit. And it's not surprising that we're not perfect drivers in later life because of all the changes that happen to us as, as we age, changes in cognition, so the way we process things, changes in eyesight. Um, for example, um, research suggests that by the age of 75 years, you might require 32 times the brightness somebody at the age of 25 does. And it takes you longer to... Um, uh, to, to recover from glare, from low sun or from traffic coming the other way that might have full beam on. Uh, and that can be um, over double, if not triple, um, the amount of time it takes you to recover from that. And just ordinary changes that happen to us all in mobility. So less mobility in neck, leg, knees, hips, um, slightly more likely to be fatigued. And these do have um, impacts on the way we drive and the safety of the drive. So it might have impact on uh, having awareness of making a decision about gap acceptance, about being distracted, changes our reaction times. Um, but like I said, that doesn't always make a huge difference on our safety. And some of that's simply because as we age, we become very experienced. We're very good at adapting to changes in our body. That's not just in driving, but in other situations as well. Um, and of course, in driving, we can use compensatory behavior. So we don't have to drive in rush hour, bad weather. We can choose when we go out and about. We don't always have to make difficult turns. We don't drive in stressful situations, don't drive when we're in a hurry. Now, that might change if we're all going to have to work uh, later on in life, because that's one of the major reasons for having to drive is for, for work purposes. And I'll come on to that a little bit in, in, in a little bit. Um, but there are some issues that, that, that come out because sometimes those things that happen to us all as we age combine together and they're just too much for us to be able to cope or adapt with. And we find uh, issues that older people sometimes have, um, particularly in the statistics, comes out with um, something that we call cognitive issues. Again, that ability to adapt and, and, and make the right choice, especially when there's lots going on all at once. And we see more collisions happen when people are turning right, at least in this country. And it's the same in countries that drive on the other side of the road when they turn left. So when you're trying, turning across traffic can be an extra source of problem for um, uh, a difficulty that can lead to extra collisions. There's things that we talk about called escalation of commitment. So sometimes people think they've made the right choice. They can begin to see they've made a wrong choice, but they don't replicate that or they don't make a, a, a change. So they, they carry on making the same mistake. So that happens particularly with people who think they press the brake pedal, uh, but they press the accelerator. Uh, and what they think they need to do is press it harder. And all that happens is you press the accelerator pedal harder. There's a little bit about low mileage as well. Those who've already perhaps self-selected to drive fewer miles are particularly those who are not particularly very good at driving. So they have more collisions. Um, and there's this forgiving feedback loop and feedback interaction we talk about, awareness of what's going on and learning from the environment around us. Now, we're all not very good at that at any stage of, of our life. So, um, you know, I think the, the car driving environment is more forgiving than any other type of environment I can think of. You can drive absolutely terribly and get away with it, but also the other way around. You can drive really well and still end up in a collision because of someone else. So those normal feedback loops in psychology we, we learn about that help us 
determine what behavior we should do in the future just are not quite as visible or they're not quite as reinforcing in in car driving as they are perhaps in other walks of life and like i said that fatigue issue can linger a little bit especially older people and later on in life lots of those things can be overcome by just an extra bit of an awareness and i'm going to go through now some of the issues that people have as they give up driving and the difficulty of being able to pick some of those elements out now not surprisingly, um, the desire to go out and about doesn't diminish in older age. People do fewer miles and drive less often, um, but that's mostly because a lot of the time you're not having to work or not having to work full time, perhaps reduced hours or volunteering instead of working or reduced the amount of, of work that's happening in later life. But people still want to go out and about and do the things they want to do. And not surprisingly, when you give up driving um, or you're unable to do the mobility that you once did in life, there's particularly health issues come into play, um, as well as mental health issues. And even some studies that say giving up driving can increase mortality and bring on earlier death, even if you account for the reasons why people have given up in the first place, which might be a health issue. So, so we, we classify it as a major life event and we wanted to really know why. What, why is it such an issue? When we find all these issues about people being trapped in their own homes due to lack of suitable transport, particularly everyday things that we might need to do, go to the supermarket, go to the post office, access health care and, and things like particularly accessing hospital, particularly an issue for, for people. In some research I've done, I've tried to categorise that so it's not just about the practical issues. That comes out across the board all the time when I talk to older people about giving up driving. Practical issues are key, the need to get from A to B as reliably, as cheaply as possible. But it isn't just about that. It's also about psychological or social or affective issues. So there's a little bit about giving up driving and the difficulty that that poses on, on asking other people for lifts, for example, changes your identity, your self-esteem, your role within the family, how you feel about life. Um, there's some quotes on the left hand side about not being able to help the family um, if you give up driving and how important it is to help the family when you, you, you can drive. And then the top level of needs that lots of people forget is just the need to be mobile for no particular reason, just to be able to go for a drive or go for uh, a, a stop by the sea or to see see the ocean i think too often we think that older people just end up wanting to drive so you can go to hospital appointments or go to the shops um but of course that's no different to any other time of life people want leisure activity they want to see the world going around them so those social issues are really important and when we replace um, driving with other forms of transport we sometimes forget particularly those social and affective the psychological needs if you like and the aesthetic needs in between so here's a bit from the study where i studied um, or I had the privilege of working with a number of older people as they gave up driving um, and went through the process of giving up driving. Some of them had already begun that process. Some of them had just recently had to give up driving for one reason or another, but lots of them I was able to work with over a period of a, a year and a half and go through the process with them. Really, we categorized them into three uh, distinct groups. So the, the first of all, those that great gave up very sensibly um, and managed to have successful time giving up driving were those on the green category on the left hand side there so they often had years of planning they thought about giving up driving years in advance they trial and errored with other modes of transport um, they were often very independent people who enjoyed a challenge they're often people who'd used other modes of transport throughout their life um, in terms of their own driving safety they'd always thought they weren't perhaps a brilliant driver they were the what we might call the worried well so they were always asking other people um, for support or they were worried about what what their driving was was doing to other people um, so really they, they they started thinking about what alternatives around them they need other alternatives around them if they got them then that's um, really useful people talking about rediscovering their local area when they'd given up driving seeing the shops in their local area a lot more differently um, and force them to do things in a local area. So they, they become involved in lots of local stuff rather than driving all over the place. That was largely, interestingly, over, well oversubscribed by females in that category, much more likely to be sensible about giving up driving. The middle category um, were people who uh, very much based their giving up driving around family and friends. So they were semi-sensible about it. They took feedback from others well. They asked for feedback proactively often from others. Um, they get their practical and emotional, very important to have both from uh, support from family and friends, sometimes from neighbours as well. And they'd be very good at reciprocation. So if they felt that um, somebody had been giving them a lift somewhere, um, they'd pay them back 
often it was that money wasn't acceptable. Um, it was often in, in cakes or in food or in one case, somebody took the parcels in for a street because they were in more often. And the people in the street, it was a small cul-de-sac, often took her out and about um, for, for journeys or got food in for her when needed. Um, so they saw the element of giving up driving very much as a social thing. Sometimes they even saw the replacement as a social thing. So the comment at the bottom about the bus being a real bit of fun. I go on it with friends. We have a great day out. Now, the, that was, a, again, slightly more females than males in that category. Now, the most difficult category is the red category at the end. They're the ones who hadn't thought about giving up driving at all. They thought they'd be able to carry on driving forever. Um, they usually had done very little research about alternatives, um, and they were the ones who struggled most when having to give up driving for one reason or another, often a health issue, um, sometimes because of a collision, rarely because they'd had their license actually taken away from them, but they were in that group. So mostly men in that group um, and uh, mostly people who thought that they were very, very safe drivers and would never have to give up, hadn't really contemplated the opposite. So really, we've got to... Think about how when we think about alternatives for people and giving up driving, we've got to think about perhaps different solutions for different groups of people on there. And you don't need to know exactly the detail of this diagram or perhaps what it was just a way of categorizing some of the ways we might help people or some of the difficulties that people were overcoming in that group of people giving up driving. And I've categorized them into cultural elements of the things that surround you um, in society, very difficult to change, things that have been around for a long period of time, but also exported by laws and rules, um, social capital, so the support of family and friends, infrastructure capital are uh, things that in place that might support you so having some infrastructure some roads and uh so having a bus service having a pavement those kind of things that are very close to to the mobility you need to do as well as your own individual capital and just to go through some of those just briefly cultural capital so that thing that surrounds us all in society i think we've created very much a society around the car particularly over the last 40 50 years something that um, we've termed in the business institutional carism we don't even notice a bit like institutional racism don't even notice when people are doing things that exclude people who haven't got a car at the end of the day the car is king so we assume people will do what they need to do by having a car it's particularly true in rural areas particularly true on the edge of towns and and city centres and it means we've created a society where there's an agglomeration of shops and services at the edge of city and town centres on cheap land cheap for businesses to put them there but it passes the cost over to people who have to drive there lots of closure of local shops and services in combination with that we've even got these mega super hospitals as well at the end of the day that have um, created uh, difficulty and access for people to get there brilliant for the nhs they can save money in such great big places and people can learn off each other and people can be passed through the services in them but very difficult if you're a patient there who hasn't got a car in order to get to those places so i always think the part of the, yeah, the the cost of mobility has been passed to the individual so we've got to try and change that somehow i mean on the right hand side as an example, perhaps a facetious, silly example, think about how much different modes of transport are found in popular media. How much do we sing uh, songs about cars, about walking, about trains? How much do they appear in films? That's just a, a, a good way, I often show it to my students, a good way of trying to get to think about just how embedded in society the use of the car is. So imagine how difficult it is when you have to give up driving. The study down the bottom about broken wrists and driving was just interesting because that's a temporary disruption if you like, to people's driving. Uh, and I found that even with a broken wrist and people's arms in plaster, 20% still drove um, a, a car, even if it was quite difficult to be able to do that, much more likely to be males, again, doing that kind of thing. Um, and everybody couldn't wait to get back, even though quite a lot of people adapted to using other modes of transport. So there's just that, that embeddedness. It's like the default position in society, if you like. And you can see that in the pandemic. This is uh, Castle Street in Cardiff, beautiful during the the first lockdown the businesses as they reopened spilled out onto the street it became a walking and cycling haven lots of people spending time there but, but despite cardiff being a city that pledged to reduce carbon and to be reducing climate change it couldn't wait um, in uh, to get back to normal as you can see in the bottom right hand corner with cars and cycles coming along so we haven't really learned anything we've moved back to the default position and that just shows the strength of the car culture in society today so if you're giving up driving within that car culture just think how difficult that is for people to make those decisions 
infrastructure is the actual physical property of the things that we need in order to complete our journeys. And again, we really don't do that very well. O older people telling me about difficulties with blistered paving, difficulties with tripping because the pavements aren't up kept very well, difficulties navigating where there's parked cars. And gradually we've seen um, a reduction in uh, the number of older people walking in local areas. Again, it went up during lockdown, but has returned to, to low levels since. And we just got to provide better infrastructure for it. In the top right, the bus um, provision has fallen in every area across the UK. Um, slight increase perhaps in some rural areas of provision um, in terms of number of buses, but not in terms of uh, absolute distance. More people having to change buses if they are using buses, the service being smaller buses, that kind of thing. So the provision of things still isn't particularly very good. And this is just horrendous. I think if you're providing for people and you want people to be active travellers, um, just look at how poorly we look after older pedestrians. Again, some of the injuries and collisions you might find on pedestrian areas are due to frailty in later life, but we can't account for all of that in such a huge increase. So we go on about older drivers being dangerous um, and danger to themselves, more likely to, to be injured or died as a, as a result of collision. But look at how bad it is for pedestrians, particularly female, uh, female pedestrians in that diagram at the bottom. So older people make up about 22% of the population, 19% of pedestrian miles, but 42% of those killed as a pedestrian. So surely some of that change has got to, to, to be put into place. In terms of social capital, we can see brilliant examples of uh, support from family and friends in local areas. Um, getting shopping in, taking people for lifts, um, much more difficult for people to be able to ask for support for just a day out somewhere uh, or for leisure activities, which I know is really important for us all uh, at all ages, but very important for older people. Um, they say, well, I can't really ask for, for um, you know, to, to take me down just down to the beach. I, I, I feel really cheeky asking for, for, for that, but we know that's good for people's health. So we're saying don't be frightened to ask for for help it must be um uh very important for people it must be something that people do rather than just think oh i can ask my parents ask my family for stuff um when i get a lift to the hospital but i can't do that if it's just for for a day out that kind of thing and like i said reciprocation is important to, to that area and just at the individual level i think that's really important just to talk really just briefly about drivers feeding their uh, uh, about their own awareness of whether they can compensate for changes in their own in their own body and and that kind of thing and what we find time and time again is that those drivers who are actually pretty safe are the ones who are most worried about their own safety so there's a kind of circular effect going on there that people who are most aware of their own driving most aware of their own foibles uh, most aware of the changes in their body are those that that make the most changes really difficult um, to encourage those who think they're safe but aren't and there are a, it's probably a minority but a significant minority who need that change people often would welcome assessment relearning a set a welcome training that kind of thing so there is a little bit of a door open there for more people to go and have some some lessons uh go and have their driving assessed um, without fear of reprisal, without fear of having their license taken away, that kind of thing. Um, but people aren't very good at self-reflecting. We all drive day to day without thinking about what we what we kind of do. So what can we do about it? There's different suggestions and the literature doesn't bear out that one is better than than any of the others. But um, perhaps, you know, it's always good for a researcher to say this, but we need more research in these kind of things. Some countries, some states in America, some states in Australia, some countries have more stringent testing for older people to keep them safe on the road. Um, sometimes that's cognitive testing, that might be extra medical testing, some kind, some mental testing as well. Um, but we don't have any evidence that that makes any difference about weeding out those who are dangerous compared to those who are safe. There's no difference in collision rates, no difference in injury rates in countries that are more stringent than those who are not. Doesn't mean the test isn't the way forwards to do that. It's just we haven't got the right tests in place at the moment. There is a little bit of evidence to say that some very stringent eyesight testing can help. So eyesight is a key element to, um, uh, uh, to driving safely. And I, I know we're gonna hear about that in a little bit. People would very much welcome more involvement of family and friends, more involvement of doctors, more involvement of hearing from other people. At the moment, there's little 
um, discussion or debate about it, apart from what we do on here. And we need to raise that debate a little bit more, get families to talk to each other more about it and have those conversations, get GPs to talk more about it. A little bit about education and training is really important. So driver knowledge um, is, is an education and training is really important. We need a little bit more research about what how that package might look, but there is some evidence that some of that makes a difference. And as I've been going through, just making sure that the alternatives are improved and maybe something about improving the, the uh, offerings. So just to finish up, what do we give each of those three groups? So the green group, really, we need to see them as the champions of transport. We need them to be involved in lobbying local transport provision, upkeeping of local services. They're the ones who really enjoy using different modes of transport, can get out and about. They're the ones who need to to make sure it's good for other people, champion it, perhaps being buddies for other people who are going through the process of giving up driving. The middle group, the social group, there are some examples of some really good social groups that support one another during the process of giving up driving. There's one in Australia called Car Free Me. So you don't just think about driver safety, but you think about providing alternatives to people. And the red group on the right hand side, um, we just really, really need them um, uh, some kind of uh, a, play on their uh, on their delight at being really good drivers really at the end of the day and get them to take advanced driver training and education um, uh, training systems for example and build in other modes of transport to such education as we go and try and build those building blocks a bit earlier on in the in the process so that's really where I finished just remember transport is much more about just getting from A to B. There's all those practical and emotional elements involved when people are giving up driving and assessing their own ability to drive and assessing their own safety. Um, but it's really difficult when we live in a car centric society and everybody gives up their pro and goes through the process of giving up driving very differently. And we need to uh, take into account how people go through that process. And we still haven't got the solutions to helping people give up driving quite right. We've got to think about how we tailor some of those great solutions that are out there already to the individuals who need it most. And that's where I finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Charles. That was absolutely fascinating. Lots of things there to think about, and actually lots that I actually have never thought about that's really so simple. Perhaps I should begin to start thinking about it now. Um, I found just that little issue of turning right quite interesting because there's a few streets sort of in my little local town where I always find turning right quite difficult. Is it my turn to go? Is it so? Really, really fascinating that. Thank you so much. And as I said before, we are going to be answering some of your questions. So if you've got any questions for Charles, please put your questions into that question and answer and we'll hopefully get round to them later on. Now, Charles touched on eyesight. And in fact, that's one of the issues that we're going to be looking at next. Now, in particular, we're going to be looking at the developing story of Margaret Philly. Now, if you were watching our webinar last year, you'll probably remember how Margaret was telling us about the rather worrying diagnosis that she just had about macular degeneration and the implications that might have on her driving ability. And it might actually mean that it could bring her driving to, to an end sometime. And I was enormously impressed by how upbeat and positive Margaret was. And she didn't sort of try and dodge it at all. She was really kind of confronting that possibility that she could at some point have to hang up her car keys and send her driving license back to the DBLA. Well, now we're going to find out how the last 12 months have been for Margaret in conversation with Rob Hurd of the Older Drivers Forum. So over to you two. Well, thank you, Valerie. And uh, welcome, um, Margaret. So a year ago, we talked about you with your diagnosis mm -hmm. and ongoing treatment with macular degeneration. Just for those who don't know, what actually is macular degeneration, Margaret? It seems that I have um, I have older aging macular degeneration. And actually, um, statistics show that if you're over 55, it is a very common scenario. Because I was having a yearly annual uh, check tests of my eyes, then I um, was diagnosed about four years ago with this condition. Uh, I didn't know very much about it and it was extremely worrying when the optician saying goodbye to me as I went out of his room said, oh, and we'll tell you when you can't drive. So I knew there was going to be an impact, but I knew nothing about the condition at all. I have since learned 
much more detail, which is helpful. Uh, as I say, it's quite common in people over 55 and the older you get, it is very common. Yeah. It affects the retina and the central vision area at the back of the eye. It also affects your color recognition and picking out small detail. It was the color recognition which I could identify with uh, because I think I've shared with you, I'm a great Telegraph crossword fan. Sorry, advertising. <laughs> and Saturday and Monday crosswords are my favorites, but some of the clues are actually embedded in red. And I was very aware three, four years ago that I was having to take that part of the crossword directly under a light or over to a window because I just couldn't read the small print against that kind of background and I had the same kind of problem with yellow and with blue so it is very much age related and uh, I am so delighted that now I'm on a process of not only understanding it myself and the things that you can do personally include eating lots of fruit and vegetables and green leaf vegetables in particular so lots of cabbage and lettuce in my house. <laughs> so knowing about it and knowing that it's not unusual um, has helped me come to terms. Yeah, yeah. And and in fact, it, as you said, Margaret, it's a very common condition. In fact, um, research has shown that around about 33% of people aged 40 and above affected by four main eyesight conditions, one by glycoma, cataracts, uh, blindness, or as you've said, age-related macular degeneration. So we know a year ago we spoke to you and luckily then you were still able to drive. So what happened in the last year with your condition, Margaret? Are you still able to drive and what's changed with you? I now have six monthly um, eye appointments with my local optician uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, the conversation always ends up with, uh, am I? And the answer is still yes which is both a surprise and a delight. Um, but my most recent check in July, January and July are my two months of my optician. In July, um, my optician showed me a scan of my right eye and she was very worried about the change. I had a very tiny blob of fluid uh, attached to the back of the eye, the macula. And I forgot to say there are two status um, types of macular degeneration, dry and wet. And I had until that observation been classed as dry in my condition. She explained that she would be writing straight away to the hospital and that I could expect to be seen within a month. I was seen and had my first injection, the first of three, within two weeks, which is tremendous. I, I have written to the hospital since, because not only were they quick off the mark, for which I'm very grateful, but when I went two weeks ago for my third injection, the scan showed that the blob of fluid has dis disappeared completely. In fact, I found out that there is a government sort of standard and we all feel so sorry at the moment with the NHS under pressure but if you have a diagnosis of macular degeneration with the possibility of it getting much worse they should see you and do something about it within two weeks and they did incredible so yeah. I'm very grateful uh, well, it's really pleasing to see that you can still drive and it's really pleasing to hear that, you know, the your optician and the hospital are so quick to be able to come up with solutions and, and work with you with that. But obviously the future, Margaret, there will be a time, as you well know, you'll have to retire from driving. And I mean, are you making plans for that? What sort of things are you looking at for the future, understanding that you won't be able to drive? I think for me, I'm, I'm fortunate because I'm an optimist and I see any changes as, as a challenge and what can I do to enjoy myself and 
and to help and support others. So I have made a, a lot of inroad myself emotionally. I am physically, I think um, Charles might be interested, I'm working on contentment myself. So I'm doing a lot of reading, embroidery and things that I really enjoy and um, are good for my well-being and, and health of mind. But I've also found out, I make sure that my bus pass is completely up to date. Um, I stayed with my son recently in Feltham and I can get a bus straight to Kew Gardens. How wonderful is that? So I know that there are opportunities that I can look forward to. But I have also, um, I'm fortunate, I've made contact through yourself with Wessex drivability because to be carless, I know that I can look and my own community does have a community bus, but there are various things that can support and help me. Yeah, well, that's absolutely brilliant, isn't it? It's, it's great to hear you're being so positive to look outside the box. And so for people's knowledge, our nationally driving mobility, Wessex Drivability is one of those driving mobility centres. Nationally, they've got these mobility hubs, which have been funded by the Department for Transport. And anybody can freely contact one of your local mobility centres. So just go to driving mobility, put in there and you'll be able to see find your local hub and they will look at ways of help to help you still drive or still get around without the use of a car so very useful um organization to have a look into for those who do need to retire from driving so we talked about you got getting picked up with your eyesight from the optician what would you would you suggest people have regular eyesight tests what would you say about that well, I think my experience in the last three months with the discovery by my optician, my um, referral to the hospital and their very quick prompt action just proves that if you do go very regularly, um, then, you know, you can actually help and see and drive for longer. So it's in your best interest to make sure that you do have eyesight tests. So please do. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with you because as Charles was mentioning, as we age, our acuity, our distance can vary, our field of vision, so we can't always see what's coming from our side, which could be why we're having collisions also at junctions, turning right across traffic, but also recovery from glare as we get older. Often that becomes a problem with our eyesight as well. So you know that I sit in a national task force for the government, um, advising the government called the Older Drivers Task Force, and we put out a report back in November uh last year and one of the recommendations was compulsory eyesight testing at the age of 70 and then every license renewal what's your thought about compulsory eyesight testing margaret um i suppose i'm fortunate again because i i have a a, a very responsible personal nature and that's why my question ever since the identification of my condition has always been should i still be driving and I'm so pleased to get a yes. So I think myself, especially a few years ago, I was next in line to a horrific accident in which one driver was killed and the other one spent two hours upside down whilst they were trying to um, extricate him from his van. And, and seeing and being involved in that and the coroner's court, um, because I was a star witness, I saw it all happen and I was there. In fact, at the end of two hours, they insisted on taking me to hospital too because of the trauma that I'd witnessed. And the coroner asked me about the whole scenario and I could say to him that I always keep two or three cars distance between me and the car in front. And he was so pleased and that saved my actual involvement. So we have to be responsible in the things that we do and to ensure that our sight is, and unfortunately, macular degeneration, peripheral vision is not affected at all. It's just yeah. central and straightforward in the detail. But as you say, glare, I don't drive at night now, 
but I do seriously think that sight is so impactful on our decision making that it ought to be compulsory. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Margaret. So thank you ever so much for telling us and updating us how you are. We'll touch base again with you next year. Hope that it still continues to be able to drive. But it's so great to hear that you're so positive about finding those alternatives. And it's so important for all of us to make sure that we have regular eyesight tests so we can pick up those conditions early. So I'll hand you back to Valerie. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you very much indeed, Rob and Margaret. And what fantastically positive news from Margaret there. She can still drive, which is wonderful, but she's really thinking about the possibility that one day she may not be able to and all the things that she's doing. As I said last year, very, very upbeat, very positive and very sensible. I've got two friends who've actually got macular degeneration. One has had to stop driving and another is just on the border, rather like Margaret. She's still getting the test and she's having injections too. So, you know, I'm kind of watching what's happening there. But it's wonderful if friends can bear in mind actually what happens to friends who have it and suddenly can't drive you know kind of ring them up now and again and say should we go somewhere because they can get a bit stuck where they are i have terrible terrible transport here so i hope it never happens to me fingers crossed anyway it was very good to hear from margaret and and as rob said we'll look forward to catching up with her again next year Right now, our next speaker is June Howlett. June is the Road Safety Officer with Transport for Buckinghamshire, and she's very involved with the delivery, the evaluation and the development of driver training seminars and also assessment. Now, June became a, a driving instructor when she was uh, in, in the 90s, not when she was in the 90s, in the 90s, <laughs> 1995, aging you there a bit, June. And uh, she's also got a DVSA fleet license. And then very recently, she qualified, this is fascinating, something called an Energy Savings Trust Eco Driving Trainer. Never heard of that before, so I hope you'll inform us what that is. She's very well now uh, sort of going to talk about the detail of what's involved in overdriver assessment, you know, exactly what you have to do if you're going to take one of those courses. And she's also going to share uh, the thoughts on the importance of eyesight and also the importance to older family members who can really, you know, keep an eye on a family member who's getting older and, and just watch how they're driving. So now over to you, June. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much for the introduction, Val. And hopefully you can see my screen now. So thank you for that introduction, um, Val. Um, as she said, I'm responsible for the uh, road safety education, training and publicity throughout the county. So this includes campaigns and driver training, which is aimed at our most vulnerable road user groups. So during the presentation, I'm going to give you an overview of the Buckinghamshire Mature Driver Assessment Scheme. I'll cover a little bit of the data that guides us on what to include, how to apply, and what happens on an assessment, feedback, and how we support drivers after the assessment. We have a number of online modules, and I'll tell you about those at the end. And this is just a flavor of the Buckinghamshire Scheme but they're being delivered all over the UK by other local authorities or organisations. And I will give you details at the end about where you can find out about assessments in your area. Um, I won't go into too much of the, um, the, the statistics as I think Charles has already covered quite a lot of that. Um, but really just to say that um, evidence does suggest that after the age of 70, there is a slow increase in blameworthy collisions with 85 year olds being over four times more likely to contribute to a collision than be innocently involved in one. And in Buckinghamshire, as in many areas, we found older drivers were featuring more and more in our collisions. Not altogether surprising, um, really, as the number of older drivers increases year on year. But this did cause us to look at the types of crashes that older drivers were having, um, which indicated that there were mainly right of way collisions, which has already been spoken about by Charles and Rob. Um, junctions, especially turning right across opposing traffic, roundabouts, merging from slip roads and changing la lanes. And research shows that in your mid 70s, drivers can start to have problems assessing complex or high speed traffic 
situations. And that actually links to the top three contributory factors recorded by Thames Valley Police for older driver collisions. And those have failed to look properly, failed to judge other person's path or speed and careless, reckless in a hurry. We found that older drivers are most likely to be at fault in reversing crashes. Many of these are happening on driveways and in car parks. Some may be pedal confusion or not looking properly before reversing, and that might be due to mobility issues. And our advice after reading about these types of collisions would be, you know, don't stand in front of a reversing vehicle um, or behind one. It can and does end in tragedy. There's also evidence that driving in the dark and at peak times of the day have been shown to increase crash risk. But many older drivers self-regulate by choosing not to drive in the dark or at rush hour. Another interesting fact was that interaction with pets was one of the most commonly reported contributors to crashes or near misses. So if you've got your pet in the car with you, be careful and make sure it's well secured. But our data did indicate an increase in the number of older drivers being killed or injured. So we decided to update our existing assessment scheme to include information about where older drivers are most vulnerable, the types of crashes they're most likely to be involved in, and health issues that affect drivers as they age. We've currently got six driving instructors that deliver the scheme on our behalf. They've all had specialist training at our local mobility centre. And this was to improve their level of awareness on issues that affect drivers as they age and what simple changes or adaptions are available to help someone keep driving. And importantly, knowledge on where to signpost drivers for further help. And I think visiting the mobility centre was a really useful experience to understand the role of the mobility centre and how we actually work with them. Our assessments are what we call light touch, simple conf confidence givers for drivers that just want re reassurance that their driving is still safe. The assessment isn't just about fault finding, but rather for a way for the assessors to work with the drivers to make them aware of where they're most at risk and to help them manage or reduce that risk. We're aware that if an older driver loses their license, then they may also lose their ability to socialise and can become very isolated, which can lead to many problems. So our scheme aims to support the drivers as they age, keep them driving for as long as they can safely do so or want to. And we're also there to support and advise families. The assessment process. The objective of the assessment is to determine if a driver is safe to be driving on the roads. And if not, to identify what can be done to help. Most of those that take an assessment with us say that they're taking it to update their skills and to check that they're still safe. Reassurance, really. Some may not have driven for a while, perhaps due to ill health, or may suddenly have to start driving due to a partner being ill and having to give up driving. The assessment process starts with the client applying either online, by post, or being signposted to us to a, by a healthcare provider. I then assign an assessor and they contact them directly to book the drive. Our assessors meet the client at their own home, spend a little time completing the paperwork, which is the form that you can see on the screen there. And this gives the assessor an overview of the type of driving that person does, the confidence levels and any areas of concern they may have before we even get in the car. They also complete an eyesight test before the drive. So reading a car number plate um, from 20 metres. And if they don't pass the eyesight test, then the drive won't go ahead. So if you are thinking of having an assessment, then please do make sure you can read a number plate at the prescribed distance. The drive's going to be based on the type of driving that person does and what they want to achieve. So if they don't want to go up to the motorway, we don't make them. If they want to look at a junction or a new road layout that's been bothering them or is confusing, that's what we'll do. 
Some people want to practice parking, going into a new car park or a route they haven't done before. And occasionally we get drivers that have changed their car and they want someone to help them familiarize with it and how to use the technology on it. So the drive is basically built around the driver and any concerns that they might have. The route would be typical of the sort of drive-in that driver normally does, but it does include a parking exercise, perhaps at a supermarket or a garden centre. And this is an opportunity for us to highlight the risks when parking or reversing. The first part of the drive is about 15 minutes, and once stopped, there's a brief chat about how the drive went, um, anything that happened, and the assessor can give feedback at that they have or any suggestions for improvements. The driver can then practice that on the second part of the drive. Before we start the second part of the drive, there's a short micro session on eyesight and changes as we age. I won't go into a lot of detail on that because I think it's already been covered, but it would be all the areas that um, Rob and Margaret were discussing earlier. And we also talk about um, has a perception and how to improve that. At the end of the drive, there's a debrief, which family members or interested parties are welcome to listen to if the driver wants them to. We ask how they felt the drive went, as it's important to get the driver's impression of how they think they did, so we can see if it correlates with the assessor's opinion of the drive. Notes from the drive are recorded on the assessment form and that's shared with the driver. And this means all comments and thoughts can be discussed to ensure everything's understood. Quite often there are questions on things that happen during the drive and the assessors have diagrams that they can show to help explain anything that's not clear. I think the most common issues are recognizing speed limits, lane positioning, junctions, mirrors, gears, observation and reversing. Um, I remember one of the instructors telling me about a lady uh, and she said she hated turning right across a busy main road to get out of her estate. She told the instructor that she usually went left down to the roundabout and then came back up. Uh, she said she felt a little bit embarrassed telling him um, because as an experienced motorist, she felt she should be able to cross that road. But as the assessor told her, she'd come up with a great solution to take the stress out of it, reduce the risk, and it probably took no longer. So don't be afraid to simplify things for yourself. If there's a safer, easier way to do it, then that would seem to be a really good choice to me. Once the assessment's finished, the assessor will give the driver his opinion on how the drive went. So the outcome. Uh, just on the uh, picture there is the late Paddy Hopkirk, who won the Monte Carlo Rally in a Mini Cooper in 1964. And Paddy was one of our most more famous drivers who took an assessment. And I think he was probably the fastest too, but a really good ambassador for um, driving assessments. So outcomes. Mostly the drivers will know how they've done. So the result isn't usually a surprise. There are a range of options our assessors can give at the end of the drive based on a risk assessment of low, medium or high. And briefly, they're satisfactory. So a few recommendations to work on. And this is the outcome for the majority of our clients. If all has gone well, then we would agree a reassessment date with the client if they wanted one. And we'd write to them nearer the time uh, to remind them. And that's generally somewhere between one and five years, depending on what they agree they'd like. Then we come down to the medium risk. So the assessor may feel that the client would benefit from further lessons if there were some areas of concern. This is probably about 5% of clients and the majority do take the extra lessons to bring their risk down. And again, we'd agree another assessment when they felt they might like one. Or on the extreme end of the scale, it may be that we feel that we cannot help as it's outside our scope. Then we may refer them to the mobility centre for more specialist help. And our assessments are a simple assessment 
just about reassurance, building confidence and supporting drivers as they age. A way to check their driving's okay for their peace of mind. But we are not medically trained and the mobility centres are there for the drivers that we can't help. I would say in the majority of these cases where the drive is unsafe, the driver usually knows the time has come to cease driving and is looking for an, a professional opinion to convert, confirm their own thoughts or those of their family. Sometimes drivers will tell us that they feel pressure to keep driving, perhaps because they're being relied on to drive other family members. And this can be difficult when they actually recognise that they shouldn't be driving. We'll try to work with those drivers and see what options are available to help them stay mobile. There are many volunteer organisations that can help when there are no regular bus routes. But be assured we are doing everything we can to support a driver to keep driving for as long as they can safely do so. The assessments followed up with a full report of the drive and any recommendations. So they have the feedback in writing and there's no ambiguity. Some drivers share these with their doctors and family members, and most drivers are happy to agree to a reassessment in the future. And about a third of all our assessments each year are in fact reassessments. I think once, some, once someone's had an assessment, they see the benefit. It's like having a regular health check for your driving. And I think they realise that if they keep their skills up, then they should be able to drive um, with confidence in the future. We developed an online module for older drivers and their families, and this covers many issues such as eyesight, medication, fatigue, distractions, journey planning, information about vehicle adaptions and licensing. And there are also some hazard perception videos on there where you can actually practice your scanning techniques. It takes about 15 minutes to complete. It's free to access and the address is on the screen there. There's also uh, modules on speed management and winter driving, and you can access those free as well. I've added some useful contact details on this slide. Uh, for more information on our older driver assessments and the e-learning module, the website and my email address is on there. The Older Driver Forum, where you can find out about driving assessments offered nationally, the Driving Mobility website for more specialist help and the Buckinghamshire Community Transport Hub. If you Google Community Transport for your area, th there's loads of information will come up um, with what's available. I do hope the information was useful, maybe even makes you consider an assessment. Thank you very much for listening and I'll join you again later for any questions you might have. June, that was fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. I've still got a question to ask you if I get a chance later about that uh, eco driving trainer qualification that you've just got. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Now we're going to move on to our last speaker today, who is David Motten, who is the road test editor for Good Motoring. I mentioned earlier that that's the quarterly magazine, the membership magazine for the GEM uh, members. Great magazine, really worth having. Now, he used to be the editor of What Car, and he's also a judge for the UK Car of the Year Awards. I'd never heard of those awards. They sound rather interesting. He's with us today to provide an update on all the very latest technologies. So let's find out just exactly what they are. Over to you, David. Hello, everyone. As Val said in her introduction, my name is David Motton, and I'm the road test editor of Good Motoring. I've been a motoring journalist for over 23 years. So today I'm going to talk to you about the latest in-car safety technology. It's a world full of jargon and a whole alphabet soup of acronyms. It can be confusing for drivers of any age, especially as there are often several names for the same type of technology. Safety features in our cars fall into two broad categories, active and passive. Passive safety lessens the risk of death or serious injury in a collision. Crumple zones, side impact protection and airbags are all examples of passive safety features. Over the past quarter of a century, huge strides have been made in this field. Active safety features are designed to prevent accidents from happening in the first place. These include stability control systems, anti-lock braking 
and collision warning systems. Some of these features may already be familiar to you. Some may have you scratching your head and asking, what's that? Don't worry, I'm going to talk you through these features one by one in a few moments. Modern cars now hold up remarkably well in a crash. Car drivers and their passengers are surviving accidents that might have been fatal 30 years ago, so there's now a heavy emphasis within the motor industry on active safety, preventing dangerous situations from leading to collisions so you don't need to rely on the passive safety systems that have made modern cars so tough and robust in a crash. It's great to have a car that holds up well in a collision, but how much better is it to have a car that helps the driver avoid a collision in the first place? Some active safety features are quite familiar and generally well understood, but in brief, I'd like to touch on them as they're very important, with a big role to play in road safety and because the technology that's been introduced more recently has been built on the foundations that these systems have laid. ABS, or anti-lock brakes, have been compulsory for all new cars in the UK and EU since 2004. As the name explains, anti-lock brakes prevent the wheels from locking, and by locking I mean no longer rotating while the car is still moving. The important benefit of this is that the driver still has control over the car's direction while braking, whereas if the wheels lock, the car will go straight on even if the driver is trying to steer away from a collision. Although you almost certainly drive a car with ABS every time you get behind the wheel, you may not have experienced anti-lock brakes in action. When the system activates, you may feel a pulsing through the brake pedal. Some drivers react to this by lifting their foot from the brake. It's really important that you don't do this. Keep applying firm pressure to the pedal and let the ABS system do its job, or you will increase your stopping distance. ESC, or Electronic Stability Control, goes by many names. Depending on the car you drive, it could be called ESC, ESP, DSC, DSTC, PSM, VSA, or VSC. The list goes on. The name doesn't matter too much, as all these systems are essentially there to do the same job, and have been compulsory for new cars since 2014. Stability Control helps you keep control of the car. The system uses sensors to detect whether the front or rear wheels are skidding, as might happen if you corner too quickly or hit a patch of oil in the middle of a bend. By adjusting the throttle and even braking individual wheels, stability control reduces the risk of the car sliding off the road. These systems aren't infallible. They can't change the laws of physics. But, according to one Swedish study, driving a car with stability control in poor weather makes a fatal accident 32% less likely. Some cars will have different modes for the stability control, which raise the threshold at which it will intervene. But really, in everyday driving, there's no sensible reason not to have the maximum possible assistance in preventing a skid and recovering control if the car does slide. Like ABS, ESC is a very worthwhile technology with a proven record of improving road safety. Anti-lock brakes and stability control remain vital new car safety features, but the next generation of active safety is becoming ever more sophisticated. Collectively known as Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, or ADAS to include yet another acronym, these safety features help the driver steer brake and control the vehicle's speed. Let's look at some of the ADAS systems you are likely to find in your current car or indeed any new model you are thinking of buying. Like stability control, autonomous emergency braking or AEB is known by a plethora of different names such as active city brake, city brake support or front assist. Now, you could drive thousands of miles and never notice that your car has this feature, but one day you could be really glad of it. Autonomous emergency braking uses radar, cameras or a combination of the two to detect traffic up ahead. 
If the system concludes a collision could be about to happen, it will warn the driver, usually by sounding an alarm or flashing lights on the dash. If the driver fails to react in time, it will apply the brakes to either reduce the severity of the collision or, better still, avoid the crash completely. When this technology first appeared, the insurance industry's research body, Thatcham, predicted it could save over 1,200 lives on UK roads in a decade. In a few short years, autonomous emergency braking has gone from a new technology available on a handful of cars to being standard fit on the majority of new models. Thatcham has described autonomous emergency braking as probably the most important development in car safety since the seatbelt. Of all the advanced driver aids I'm going to describe today, this is the one I would most want to have on my next car, and I would urge you to do the same. Lanekeep Assist uses a forward-facing camera to monitor white lines in the road and will warn the driver if they are drifting out of the lane without indicating. This warning usually takes the form of a noise, a vibration through the wheel, a warning light, or all three. Active Lane Keep Assist goes further and will actually steer the car back towards the centre of the lane if the driver doesn't react. This system works best on dual carriageways and motorways. It does have its limitations though, as bad weather or faded lane markings can reduce its effectiveness. What's more, some drivers find it obtrusive and irritating. It's usually possible to switch the feature off if it's not wanted, although many cars will default back to the system being active whenever the car restarts. Most drivers will be familiar with cruise control, a feature that holds a set speed on A-roads and motorways so the driver doesn't have to spend long periods holding their right leg in one position. Adaptive cruise control goes further, slowing down as the car approaches another vehicle or speeding up again as you move out of lane to overtake. Sometimes shortened to ACC, adaptive cruise control uses the same kind of sensors as autonomous braking to detect vehicles up ahead and adjust the car's speed to suit, all without the driver touching the pedals. Where things get really clever, or really disconcerting depending on your point of view, is when a number of advanced driver assistance systems are combined. The likes of Volvo's Pilot Assist join together the functions of Active Lane Keep Assist and Adaptive Cruise Control to drive the car for you under certain circumstances, although always under the close supervision of the driver. All of these systems are intended to make the road safer, but they are not universally popular with all drivers. The best systems only intervene when absolutely necessary, but if a driver experiences false alarms or finds the system interferes with the safe driving of the car, then faith in the safety benefit can be eroded. I'll give a personal example. I used to run a Suzuki Vitara for a long-term review. The autonomous braking system would regularly start beeping and flashing as I approached a set of traffic lights if I was traveling straight on and there was stationary traffic in the right turn lane. Likewise, I've driven a number of cars with very intrusive active lane keep assist systems that try to steer the car to the center of the lane, even on country roads where it may be beneficial to position the car differently to improve your view of the road ahead. Some would also argue that there's a risk the driver will come to rely on the electronic safety net these systems provide and will become a less attentive and careful driver as a result. Even though I will put my hand up and say that I sometimes get frustrated by these safety systems, the evidence strongly suggests that they make a positive contribution. One study in the US found that cars fitted with autonomous emergency braking and lane departure warning were 23% less likely to be in a collision than cars with neither system. Blind spot detection, which warns the driver if there's a vehicle in the blind spot, was associated with a 14% reduction in collisions.
The latest driver assistance systems can seem like inviting a backseat driver into the driver's seat with you, but Active Lane Keep Assist and other similar technology can generally be turned off if preferred. I would urge you to understand how the systems fitted to your car work and to think about the circumstances in which they can be effective before rushing to switch them off. As individuals, we may find such technology annoying at times. I know I certainly do, but there's strong evidence that these systems can make the roads safer. They do not take responsibility from the driver, at least not for a few more years while self-driving technology matures. A competent and careful driver is still the most important safety feature of any car. But advanced driver assistance systems can catch the mistakes which even careful drivers make from time to time and can prevent a momentary lapse of concentration from leading to a serious collision. Thank you very much indeed, David. Fascinating new technology actually makes you feel you ought to go out and buy a new car, doesn't it, to have all that, those sort of safety features. Well, we've actually now, with David, come to the end of our sort of formal part of our webinar. Uh, so now we've got some time. We're running a little bit late, but I think we have got some time for some questions. I said earlier that it would be probably June and Charles, but I think we've got actually questions for other people as well, other, other speakers. We've got one here for Rob Hurd. Uh, are you there, Rob? Yes, you're there. Uh, this question goes, what specific highway infrastructure improvements would you like to see to make roads safer for older motorists? Yes, so um, as I was saying earlier, I'm a member of the Older Drivers Task Force recommending things to the government. And we've reported on this for a couple of times now, once back in 2016 and recently 2021. And the recommendations we're showing for making the infrastructure much easier and better for uh, older motorists is one, larger fonts. So when you are driving down and looking at signage, let's make it clear and obvious to people to be easily read. The other thing is often backing plates like uh, coming up to a giveaway sign putting a fluorescent orange or yellow background to make it much clearer so people are much more visible where there's a lot going on with signage and background colors and things the other thing is protected merged lanes so when you are joining a motorway or a fast large road making those slip roads much longer and a protected lane which then gives you much more time to be able to merge with the traffic and obviously we talked about right turning right across junctions uh charles and june both mentioned that so some of the research has shown that actually if you replace a t-junction with a mini roundabout or even traffic lights the amount of incidents involving older people will reduce drastically obviously quite a lot for a roundabout but actually with traffic lights almost completely so it is investment that's required but would be safer and that's one of the things we've looked at with the government is suggesting that they do a survey of all the roads across the whole of the uk and actually identify problematic roads particularly for older drivers which we can then target and look at what we can do at junctions and various different things like that so there's a lot that we can actually do with our infrastructure for our aging population thank you rob gosh looking at the roads all over the country that would be a task and a half. Uh, can I just remind all our all our, our panelists that, as I said, we're running a little bit late. So if you could keep your answers as succinct as possible, I'd be very grateful. This one is for Charles. Charles, would you welcome a change of approach from central government with the introduction of much stricter controls on older drivers, such as mandatory retesting, compulsory eye checks, and things like that? What's what's your answer to that? I think that well, in the in the presentation, I think I highlighted where there's extra significant stringent testing it doesn't seem to make much difference in in other countries that so i think we would definitely and i think all the presentations have said that would like to see a little bit more on uh done on eyesight so that it's not just distance but it's peripheral vision and it, it's uh acuity and 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 elements like that all taken into account i think that would make it that would make a big difference and it helps people reflect a little bit on their driving situation um as well so <laughs> that's probably what i'd like to see i mean really we can't advocate for any more stringent testing at 70 compared to 80 we you know with perhaps we ought to have it every five years throughout our life anyway help us be a bit more reflective on on whether we're driving safely thank you now i've got one here for what i've got a couple here for june um 
do why does there have to be so much emphasis on older drivers assessments being friendly no pressure no test events the consequence of poor driving decisions are potentially catastrophic so shouldn't we all try to be a little bit less fluffy about things um i'd say they're um non-threatening because in the majority of cases the assessments are satisfactory. I think it would be very easy to frighten people off from having a voluntary assessment. Ours are voluntary, so we have to encourage them to come forward. It doesn't affect the result they're going to be given. Um, you know, it's not a test, but if we feel that they're um, an unsafe driver, that would be put forward. But I think by encouraging them to come forward now, it's an opportunity for us to get over information that we want to make them aware of on eyesight, on health, on um, the types of crashes that they're most likely to be involved in as they age, where they're likely to be. So for us, the more people that we can communicate with on assessments, the better. You know, it's, it's just a, it's a way of brushing up their skills, checking for bad habits, and the fact that it's voluntary, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't want to put them off. Because, mm. as you said, they don't lose their driving license, do they? That's most important. People might think having an assessment, if they didn't pass it, they then can't drive. But it's nothing to do with you could still keep your driving license. You can still keep it unless, as I say, in, in the very rare cases mm. where we get someone whose driving's unsafe, we would then refer them to the mobility centre um, you know, where it's a lot more formal. So, right. yeah. Um, question here says, I was in the car. I, this is something that happened to me once. I was in the car with my dad this very morning. He was busy chatting as he drove me across town. And I quietly winced when he failed to see a pedestrian waiting to cross at a crossing. Should I have said something or was it better to bite my tongue? Because thankfully nothing went wrong. I would I would say how many of us have been in this situation, you know, with our own parents almost. And I would say it's definitely an opportunity to open that conversation. They may not have seen them because of their eyesight. It might have been they were going a little bit too fast, you know, for them to actually take in all the information. Definitely use it as an opener to have that conversation. You know, I, I did have the same sort of situation with my own mother um and she was a great one for you know driving she definitely in charles's red section of you know driving defined uh, she lived in a very rural part of cumbria and i can remember the children coming back from being with her one day and saying why does gran drive over the grass <laughs> you know and it was junction so then i started going with her it was like you know she'd say oh shall I take the children to the farm no no I'll come with you sort of thing and I went with her and then that was an opportunity to see it was a really hard conversation yes. um sure. but it's about how you approach it isn't it so yes definitely use it as a, an opener okay can I just ask all our other panelists if they've got a, a quick tip about how to cope with a situation like that yep yeah, um one thing that we do is um I would recommend people not to become complacent about things, not to ignore those situations, but address them in a friendly, caring way. Now, on our website, olderdriversforum.com, lots of help and support on there. In fact, Valerie, you've done some wonderful videos for us before about actually engaging with people, about having that difficult conversation. So those are often good ones to play to a loved one, show them to them and say, well, what do you think about that? What do you think on that? So those are often things, but have that conversation. Right. Charles? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with Rob. That's exactly what, what we would suggest. Um, and probably just remember, it's not just about the practical. There's a big emotional issue going on here and um, probably a good idea to talk about it away from the vehicle itself, you know, and possibly another situation. So when things are a bit more relaxed, you're just generally talking about, you know, perhaps aging in general or something you've seen on telly or something and just begin the conversation. Sometimes it's best. To, it can take quite a while as well. So give it time to talk about it, bring it up again later and another time and and things like that. So the earlier you bring it up in the conversation, the better. Repeat it and reinforce it and remember it's emotional not just practical stuff that needs to be talked about i guess yes thank you very much well very sadly i think we've come to an end uh, of our really i hope all of you have found it the most fascinating afternoon our speakers have been really terrific uh, just to say that again if you want to watch uh, this webinar again you can see it next week 
uh, it'll be on the Project Edward website, look at the webinars. And also it's a good idea to follow uh, the Project Edward Week of Action next week. And you just go to projectedward.org and you can see all the things that are happening there. You've all been marvelous. I've certainly learned quite a lot. June, I've still got a question for you about this eco trainer. I'm gonna to have to ask you next time I see you. I hope those who've watched today have found some really relevant information in there. And just again to say that if we didn't get around to answering your question, we're going to have a look at them now. We will hopefully get the information to you following this webinar. So don't despair. Don't think, oh, I asked that question and nobody answered it. It was always a bit frustrating. I've enjoyed it enormously. Thank you so much for being with us. Hope to see you again at another webinar. Till then, from me, goodbye. <laughs>